Live from Earth, it's Space Radio. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Stony Brook University and the Flatiron Institute. And for the next half hour, your agent to the stars. I got an amazing show for you today. I'm so excited. There's going to be a special guest. That's right. Today and today only, you do not have to listen to me rant about aliens or bad ideas or things blowing up in space, we get someone else to talk about. And that's a treat for everyone. This show lives on listener questions. We record every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern here in Spaceman Studios in New York City. So leave a voicemail to get yourself on the air. You can also follow along live with our space cadets tuning in live from around the world, including but not limited to Redmond, Washington, Columbus, Ohio, Duluth, Minnesota, Washington, D.C., France, Indiana, Portsmouth, England, Texas, Orange County, California, London, UK, Pell City, Alabama, and Howell, New Jersey. You can go to spaceradioshow.com for the links to all the episodes, the archives, how to get to the live streams to join the Space Cadets, and more info about our guests, including this one. Now, I would have to give always a big shout out to Nancy. Graziano for producing the show and getting us some of the best guests in the world. Tonight's guest is no exception. We have Teasel Muir Harmony. She is the curator of the Project Apollo collection at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. In addition to her duties at the Smithsonian, which are numerous, varied, and interesting, she teaches at Georgetown University and is a contributor to the television series Apollo's Moonshot. Teasel is the author of Apollo to the Moon, A History in 50 Objects, and she has a new book, Operation Moon Glow, A Political History of Project Apollo. She explores how and why the moon landing became one of the most decisive geopolitical events of the 20th century. What an impressive resume. Teasel, welcome to Space Radio. Thanks so much for having me on. Oh, no, it's it's our excitement. It's our thanks to you. Let's get started with Operation Moonglow. Before I encountered the title of your book, I had never, ever heard of Operation Moonglow. Could you describe to me and the audience what this is about and what does it have to do with the Apollo Project? Sure. So... <laughs> the the name of the book actually comes from a diplomatic tour that uh, President Nixon took immediately following the first lunar landing in 1969. And he called it Operation Moonglow because he was going to use the popularity of the moon landing to travel throughout Southeast Asia. And um, he had this idea that it would make uh, his new foreign policy agenda more appealing or palatable uh, to people in Southeast Asia. Um because of the interest and, and the enthusiasm for um, the moon landing. But the reason it, I chose it for the name of my book is because the book is more broadly about the role of space flight within American diplomacy and the ways that the Apollo program in particular um, served American foreign relations interests at that time. And, and it, um, I think it was appropriate because throughout the 1960s, there was a similar kind of expectation that space space flight would um, help ease sort of other American foreign relations interests, improve relations with other countries, um, encourage alignment, and um, just support the U.S.'s interests more generally. So at the time of the Apollo Project, the 60s and 70s, what were those U.S. interests abroad? And how did our political leaders and presidents think that Apollo was going to help? Well, in the, the context is so important and I and I love when everyone talks about the new space race, I always want to point back to what the, that context was, what was going on at that moment when um, Kennedy proposed that the United States send humans to the moon because it was so important essential to why he did that. And so what was going on more broadly is the Cold War. So the United States and the Soviet Union um, were competing for global influence and both saw each other as threatening expansionist forces um, in the world. And this is also importantly a moment where you have lots of newly independent nations. There's the post-colonial movement and um, incredible amount of, of 
new countries um, and both the Soviet Union and the United States were competing for influence at those countries. So the United States wanted countries to become liberal democracies um, and align with U.S. interests. And the Soviet Union was hoping um, to influence countries so that they would become communist. And then also very importantly um, was the somewhat recent introduction of nuclear weapons after with World War II um, and this idea that we can't have the same type of wars anymore. And so there was a big turn to psychological warfare and symbolism and, and competing in, in other types of ways. And so the United States and the Soviet Union both invested in spaceflight as a way to influence people, especially in these um, new nations. So did it work? Did the United States gain a lot of in of of appreciation and foreign policy objectives uh, after and during the the Apollo missions? It worked somewhat. So um, it, the context was complicated, and there were other things going on, like the Vietnam War. So it wasn't it wasn't done. You know, literally the moon landing was in a vacuum, but it wasn't actually. Um, politically speaking. So, uh, but it did have a big influence. So over half the world's population followed the flight. In general, people were very excited and enthusiastic about it. Um, Nixon saw it as very helpful at the time. Um, there were uh, the ways that it impacted sort of small day-to-day -day things like uh, displacing headlines and newspapers about the Vietnam War and instead something like uh, lunar exploration, which was getting people more excited and enthusiastic. So that was seen as beneficial. Um, it created opportunities for um, American diplomats around the world to meet with foreign leaders. Uh, astronauts would go on these diplomatic tours. And um, this, was, this was a way for the United States to promote um, a side of the country that was seen as as really positive and that was uh, essential at that time if you think of what was going on in the 1960s and into the early um, 1970s and so it was impactful but it, it was competing against these other things and so it's, it's hard to say but um, uh, importantly when humans first set foot on the moon uh, so the world uh, just stood still and people on every single continent followed uh, that that mission live. And there was a sense of unity expressed by many people. And that was seen as um, really accomplishing some American objectives and that the United States was almost building this global community um, around an American program. And that was seen as um, a huge political benefit for the country. Was the Apollo mission would it be fair to characterize it as primarily a geopolitical exercise rather than a, a technological and engineering one? Well, it was primarily a geopolitical exercise for President Kennedy, that's for sure, and for many members of Congress who funded it. I think Apollo, it's best not to, <laughs> to characterize or put it too much in a box in any way, because it is also one of the most magnificent um, technological programs in history as well. And um, the, the science that was done on Apollo was quite important. Um, and although it's not the primary reason that Kennedy pursued lunar exploration. He was very explicit about his objective and um, that it was for geopolitical influence. I think that the the, the program has a lot more um, to it and the way we need to sort of understand it, think about it, uh, needs to include all these different dimensions. But it, when it comes to why, <laughs> why did the United States send humans to the moon? It is uh, for political purposes. Were the were the Apollo astronauts themselves uh, aware of this and okay with it? Uh, did they know that they were about to be sent on endless world tours and paraded around the the nation and the world uh, to to further these kinds of aims? The astronauts were really aware that this was part of their duty. They saw it as. Um, the role as astronauts is service to their country, almost in the way that you serve in the military. And and um, they they were serving their country in the midst of the Cold War. And many of them were very explicit about that. So Frank Borman, for instance, who was the commander of Apollo 8, he's very, very clear that what he he didn't he wasn't that interested in exploration, he says. And he was he wanted to serve his country and he thought that this was the best way to do it and um, that. The astronauts knew that this was part of their job, that they were going to be traveling around the world, that they were going to meet with people, that they were going to be seen as representatives of their country and is sort of embodying values and um, strengths, characteristics of, of their country. So they they understood that their their role was in part as 
not only astronauts, but as diplomats. One of the things I found fascinating about the book in, in this in this era was that the Apollo mission threaded through three separate presidential administrations. And how did the aims of the Apollo mission, both the technological and engineering ones and the geopolitical ones, like all the aims, uh, evolve or not evolve through those different administrations? What did each successive president uh, see in the Apollo program? Well, um, it was important that that Kennedy and Johnson were somewhat unified during the Kennedy administration. And um, Lyndon Johnson was was so important to the American space program from the time of Sputnik uh, through the, the Kennedy administration, through his own administration, and, and um, consistently thought that it was an important thing for the United States to pursue. Um, and so Kennedy really relied on him during his administration. So he had quite a hand in that. Um, so Kennedy was very clear. It was to win hearts and minds, um, influence the minds of men everywhere, he said, who are attempting to make a determination of you know, whether or not they should be, you know, pursue liberal democracy or, or communism. For Lyndon Johnson, it, it, he ex sort of expanded the expectation of what spaceflight could do. He saw it as the launch pad for his great society. Um, he thought it was an essential thing for a nation to do and whoever led in space would lead the world. And so um, he, he has very sort of, I guess you could say, I don't know if optimistic is the right word, but, um, uh, he had great expectations for the role of space flight, not just in terms of, um, science and technology, but in terms of its impact on society and politics more generally. And then, uh, Richard Nixon, uh, really changed a lot for the American space program. Um, he, he loved the astronauts. He was excited about uh, enthusiasm around the world for the Apollo program, but he was also um, quite concerned about his own reelection and the budget and um, and sort of reassess whether or not the United States should make spaceflight the national priority or, or one of many national priorities. And he ended up thinking it should be one of many national priorities. And this is a space policy approach that um, has sort of remained consistent until this day. So Nick, Nixon really sort of shifted us into a different direction um, and uh, ended up um, supporting canceling some of the, the later Apollo missions, um, but also then greenlit the shuttle program. And so he, he really changed a lot of things. One of the things that he wanted to do with shuttle is he thought that it would be a great opportunity to um, allow more people to fly into space because the space shuttle could could, wasn't just limited to three seats. And so you could then open it up to women and minorities as well as um, people from around the world. And he thought that that was um, something worth investing in. Speaking of investments, uh, you know, here we are half a century later from the Apollo or early Apollo missions. What do you think is the lasting legacy of those Apollo missions uh, in that geopolitical landscape? Well, I I can speak from some of my own experience um, and and traveling and and meeting people from all different countries and different continents and. Um, people of a certain age or who are alive will have a story to share with me. Um, and it's, it's um, usually brought up as an important part of their lives and their memories. And it was um, one of these important world events, not just an American event, not just part of American history, but really world history. And I think that's, that's lasted to this day. And there were um, anniversary celebrations for the 50th anniversary of the moon landing around the world. It wasn't just happening in the United States. And I think that that's a sign of its, lasting legacy. Um, there's also a somewhat problematic legacy with Apollo, and that's the disillusionment or the sort of idea that we should have, um, you know, had a settlement on Mars by now, or that in some ways, you know, we, we reached for the stars, we reached really high in the 1960s, and um, we just haven't been able to uh, to continue exploration at that, that rate and that kind of um, investment. Um, and so there's some disillusionment as well, kind of, uh, so it's a, it's a combined, I think, um, uh, legacy, but in general, um, I've at least noticed a lot of sort of a lot of goodwill and interest and, um, sort of a lasting legacy around the world, uh, when it comes to the Apollo program. 
Yeah, you have such a unique and cool position at the Smithsonian where you get to see uh, people flocking into the museum and to, to interact with and experience these artifacts. Uh, from what you've seen and, and spoken to people about, what is their impression of the Apollo? And especially kids. What, what do kids think of the Apollo missions? Um, I think that many, many people, both kids and adults, um, the more they learn about the, the Apollo program, the more impressed they are and the more surprised they are by um, how bold that decision was to send humans to the moon. So when President Kennedy proposed Project Apollo, which was 60 years ago, we're sort of in the 60th anniversary moment right now, um, the United States had a total of 15 minutes of human spaceflight experience. We were extremely unexperienced when it came to spaceflight. And the first uh, artificial satellite, Sputnik, was launched in October of 1957, so just a handful of years earlier. And um, this idea that we we're going to send humans to the moon, and that required <laughs> just in incredible ingenuity. And any time that people start learning about everything that was involved in, in getting humans to the moon and how every single stage of that mission. And um, it, it, it is it is just extraordinary. I know I'm biased, but I think that when, when people come to the museum or read books about it, they're, the more they learn, the more excited they get about it. Oh, looks like we are having a little bit of Zoom issues uh, with uh, Teasel's connection here, which is not a surprise to any of us anymore after a year of virtual meetings. Uh, this just this just tends to happen. So we will wait to see if Teasel is able to rejoin the conversation. Uh, while we wait, I will, uh, I'll take questions from the space cadets. Uh, the space cadets have been sending in some very, very cool questions that I was going to forward to Teasel about, uh, especially her role at the Smithsonian and looking forward. Uh, I, I would say one of the biggest things to happen recently, I've actually, I've not been very well connected to space and astronomy news. For the past uh, week, I have been in a committee meetings all week long, which have been very uh, fruitful, yes, uh, but very disconnecting. It's something I do every year. I take part. I'm a member of the selection committee for a Department of Energy Computational Science Graduate Fellowship, and I get the privilege every year of being a part of the team that selects the new class of fellows uh, every year. And we've spent, it's a months, months long process with multiple levels of selection and review and screening and until it reaches the final committee. Usually the top 100 candidates make it to the committee and then we have to pare it down to around 20 people. And that process takes a couple months culminating in one week of like nonstop discussion and debating. So that's rewarding and fun. And I love being a part of that greater scientific uh, uh, furthering of the next generation, but does disconnect me from the real world. So I've got no idea of what's happened this week. That's why I'm trying to get to. I think there was a test fire of the SLS, the Space Launch System, which is NASA's big bad rocket. Um, I have complicated feelings about the SLS. I had hoped to talk to Teasel about the SLS and get get her thoughts and opinions. If she's able to join us uh, in the next ten minutes or so, I'll be I'll answer that. Otherwise, we will invite her back so that we can finish this very very fascinating interview. Uh, before you disconnect, uh, you should check out Operation Moon Glow, a political history of Project Apollo by Teasel Mir Harmony. It is available in bookstores nationwide and also on Amazon. Uh, Nancy Graziano is putting those links in the chat. You can also find the show notes in the chat. And yeah, so SLS, let's talk about SLS. Like uh, we had the t last test firing was like a month ago and there was some fault and so they ha had to halt the test early. <sighs> There's a lot of, um, I think, healthy discussion about the future of NASA, the role of NASA in spaceflight, and Teasel is back 
I think we have Sorry reestablished about that. the connection. <laughs> Not at all. It is it is the the virtual life where people disconnect and reconnect. Um, so we're happy to have you back. I was just filling time by rambling. I I actually don't remember what I said. I may have started singing, which would explain why everyone disconnected from the show. Uh, we are so glad to have you back. I. I Let's just jump in. Uh, we've been talking about the past and Project Apollo and people's reactions to it and the legacy of it. Uh, let's look to the present and the future. You know, today uh, NASA tested the SLS again, and it was a successful test. I was just beginning to mention the space cadets there. There's a lot of discussion about uh, the politicization of NASA, of, of how they choose their goals, uh, what is the best approach to getting us back to the moon and to Mars. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your opinion of the SLS program in general? And, and especially how does it relate to the rise and the growth of, of private space companies? Well, I think for concerns about NASA becoming too political, um, I think it it always has been an extremely political issue. Um, the American space program has always been very political and and there are other elements to it. And, and one of the sort of lucky things about NASA is it tends to be relatively bipartisan. And so although it's political, um, you do get support from both parties, which is which has been really a, um, a central over time. Um, but with, with the SLS program, it, it, um, I read an article recently talking about SLS and how it feels like the last rocket of a, you know, a former era. And, and that might be the truth because, um, we are transitioning into the stage where, um, NASA is working with, uh, private space industry to develop, uh, more affordable, um, access to space and, um, especially when it comes to reusable rockets and um, with low earth orbit in particular, that's been really successful so far. And um, there's a lot of enthusiasm about what that might mean and who it would give access to space to and um, how that really could change uh, near earth, uh, low earth orbit um, in particular. But when it comes to um, pursuing things like lunar exploration or uh, Mars exploration, Traditionally, that's really relied on national space programs, and um, it has to be a sort of a national priority. And um, the capability so far has really also relied on um, national space programs. So we'll see. The SLS is is part of that legacy. I think people were very excited today because it feels like another step closer to um, sending humans back to the moon. And this program has been in the works for quite some time. Um, I'll remind people that, so Kennedy proposed Project Apollo in, in 1961 and uh, the last human set foot on the moon in, in 1972. And then, um, but other presidents have proposed lunar exploration programs since then. Um, both of the George Bush president, George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush proposed um, lunar exploration programs. And then um, just most recently, uh, President Trump did as well. And so there has been a lot of, interest over time to to send humans to the moon and it just it's been somewhat sort of out of reach and so this test today seemed like it might we're one step closer and it's starting to feel more like a, a sort of a reality um i think more so than it has in the past it certainly is. It, 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 no matter what it is, uh, no matter if it's a good idea or a bad idea, it is. It's is starting to exist, which is a certainly a, changes the tenor of the conversations because it's no longer really a hypothetical. And alongside that, the SLS is is the James Webb Space Telescope, J, JWST, or the Just Wait Space Telescope, which is like a decade late and a bajillion dollars over budget. Uh, one of the space cadets, Russell, is asking asking about, uh, he asked, can politics help us launch the James Webb Space Telescope? Is, is there something we could do uh, on the geopolitical stage that would accelerate the process of getting the JWST into space? Well, I, I'm not an expert uh, uh, um, on this telescope in particular. I would say that um, uh, maybe politics has helped it up to this point and that... Um, you know, the, the sort of amount of funding that's been necessary uh, to get this telescope to where it is has been much more than anyone anticipated. Um, and there have been 
engineering setbacks, I think. Um, I wish I wish I knew more details about it. I don't want to say anything incorrect, but um, there are so many examples when it comes to the American space program where there was an expectation that something uh, was going to be um, done on a, a smaller budget and in less time than it actually ended up being done. And um, fortunately, often there's enough momentum and investment at a certain point that something continues to to live and, and get supported. And SLS is an example of that. And the web is another example of that. Um, so I'm not sure if there's anything in terms of uh, diplomacy that would, or, you know, uh, politics that would help at this point. And, and fortunately it looks like it will happen this fall, I believe. So um, it's something to look forward to, but I, I think, I think we just have to wait. <laughs> we just have to wait the just wait space telescope. Now, uh, Space Cadet CDP is wondering, over under Teasel, when are we setting foot on Mars? When's it going to happen? Uh, um, <laughs> a very long time from now. Um, that's going to be, re- it's going to be really, really hard. Uh, there, there are so many challenges. I, I, I'm sure your audience is aware of them. And, um, you know, just the technological challenges are going to be huge to overcome. Uh, but then when it also comes to the levels of, of funding that it's going to be necessary to, to make it happen, the political will or uh, even, you know, the will of individuals, if, if it could happen that way, I think it's many decades away. Um, it's pro- I'm not optimistic it's my lifetime, but we'll see things things change and there, there could be um you know, new motivating factors that we don't have uh, in play today. But it's it's on a it's on a very different scale than sending humans to the moon. That's for sure. Many many new types of challenges. Do you think that there might be any a geopolitical force that would want to uh, one nation to try to send people to Mars, like Project Apollo? Do you think those kind of conditions might appear again? I think that when it comes to diplomacy, um, we'd probably be better off uh, pursuing international cooperation for that type of program and pooling our resources with other countries and pooling our expertise with other countries and and pursuing lunar exploration, Mars exploration with partners. Um, I think that it's such a different context than the space race of the 1960s. And it's not only that there was this uh, competitor in the Soviet Union. And I think people often forget the other part of that context, which is um, the, the importance of that post-colonial movement, the, the emergence of newly independent nations, and um, and the fact that space exploration was so brand new and so exciting, and, and that the United States really cared what, um, uh, really wanted to win the hearts and minds of the world. And that was, that was a national priority as well. And that was seen as a political objective. And we're just, we have different such different conditions today, not to say that that couldn't go back to being that way, but it was such a unique moment. And so I think today when it comes to space diplomacy, we've seen sort of the most success when it comes to cooperation and and working with international partners. And you have that example with the International Space Station, and um, there's much more possible, possible when it comes to lunar exploration, Mars exploration. There you have it. One last question before you go, Teasel. Very important question I ask every guest. What is your favorite kind of cheese? <laughs> uh, I like Alpine cheese personally, um, oh, and uh, Alpine cheese. And I, I love one from Vermont, which is Alpha Tolman, and it's made by Jasper Hill. Jasper Hill out of Vermont, Alpha Tolman. I'm looking that up. It's, what it's, what, it's what are his tasting cheese, notes here? What should I look for? <laughs> It's nutty <laughs> and cheesy, it's, and it's it is, and that the the, text, the texture is um, is just right, the right combination of of sort of rich, but not not like a brie or something, which is I think is too okay. much for me. Rich, but not too rich. I love it. Uh, Teasel Mir Harmony, how can people find out more about you? You're absolutely fascinating person. You've got a lot to to say, uh, so much more than we can contain in a single interview. I hope to have you back in the future. But in the meantime, where can people find out more about you and all of your amazing work and your new book? Well, um, my new book is a great, a great way to learn about my research. Um, 
and uh, sort of can be found everywhere or my earlier book on um, Apollo artifacts or at the Smithsonian. We're working on new exhibits and um, we do a lot of programs there. So there's always things going on here in Washington, D.C. All right. That sounds good. Thank you, Teasel, again for joining the show and on behalf on, of all the space cadets, including like the, the real ones that went to the moon and the ones that, that joined the chat every week. I thank you for your work. We will catch you around later. Thank you for having me. All right, space cadets. It's the end of the interview, and you know what that means. It means that, unfortunately, this broadcast is almost done. Thank you for joining me on this voyage of space radio. Once again, I'm Paul Sutter. This show is brought to you by you. Go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to learn how you can contribute. You can also drop a super chat in YouTube. Thank you, Russell, for doing that at the beginning of the show. I really do appreciate it. And, of course, thank you, Nancy Graziano, for producing the show, getting amazing guests guests like Teasel Muir Harmony and for wrangling the space cadets. Catch the live stream every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Visit spaceradioshow.com for more info, links to the live stream locations and the episode archive. You can follow me on all social channels at Paul Matt Sutter. If you want to find out more about Teasel, check out those show notes. There will be links. And of course, thanks again, space cadets, for listening. See you next week. And remember, science is for sharing. End of